Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of t for c If you're interested in breaking into entrepreneurship, especially something that involves making and selling stuff, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest founded his company, Findlay Hats, in his living room in late 2013. And today he's got more than a dozen employees and they've moved to a big old warehouse and They were picked up by the largest action sports retailer in the world. But before I introduce you to Jimmy Hickey, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's t for cs weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays, and it's got unique insights into dozens of different industries from the professionals who are actually working in them. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org. And the sign up box is right there. Now, my Java lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Jimmy Hickey, the founder of Findlay Hats, which launched in late 2013 from his living room, where he and his then-girlfriend had a small handheld grommet press, a sewing machine, a camera, a computer, and about 80 hats. The rest, as they say, is hat history. Before launching Findlay, Jimmy had spent most of his professional life as a professional photographer, covering action sports, taking portraits, and doing documentary work. Jimmy, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated out there in beautiful Portland, Oregon and ready to go? I am caffeinated and ready to rock and roll. And that was an amazing intro. I'm uh, so grateful to be here and excited to uh, share my story with the Java lovers. Yay. So what's your favorite Java? I know coffee is big in Portland. Oh, man. Yeah. Shout out to Stumptown. Lots of good coffee in this city. Uh, I mean, I'm just I'm a classic, just black coffee kind of guy wherever I don't mind drip coffee versus a little bit of cold brew. Whatever it is, the more caffeine in my veins, the better. (laughs) You and me both. Well, I had the (laughs) pleasure, as I was telling you before we started recording, to work for the Global Humanitarian and Development Organization Mercy Corps, which has its headquarters in PDX. So I got to visit a lot and drink a lot of Stumptown. (laughs) Love that coffee. I love their hair of the dog. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I like really strong coffee. Mm -hmm. So I hear you there loud and clear. (laughs) So before we get into what you do at Finley Hats, that's going to be in our main time for coffee interview. And so our listeners should check out show notes to see if that episode has already dropped. Right now, we're going to tap into your wisdom and expertise, Jimmy, as an entrepreneur to help our young listeners who may have kind of an idea right now, or maybe they don't have an idea, but they think they may want to start something at some point. So let's dive into our 10 espresso shots. These are the 10 questions to help our listeners learn more about, in this case, entrepreneurship, starting a business. First espresso shot. Okay. First espresso shot. What entry-level jobs, Jimmy, are available to young people who want to break into entrepreneurship. The uh, entry-level jobs available to anyone 
looking to enter into entrepreneurship are mostly endless. There is an amazing amount of resources out there and opportunities with the e-commerce market, like selling things online, growing every single day right now with more and more people across generations being open to shopping online. The opportunities have never been better to start a business and get out there, learn, grow and uh, improve. So there's really pretty endless possibilities out there for anyone looking to start a business or, uh, you know, expand on an idea. And what about if they are not quite ready to pull the trigger on starting their own business, but want to work for a company like yours, a, a small startup, not a tech startup, but maybe more in the manufacturing line of things. What are the entry level titles and jobs they should be looking out for? So we, we're kind of in a unique position because no one that works here went to school for general hat making, even from our, our marketing department to our like laser engraving or uh, embroidery situation. No one here is classically trained in anything. Uh, we recently brought on a product designer who's going to school for product design and <laughs> That's the first person who's kind of like using his specialty uh, for work here. So really, the the opportunities are still pretty high open for anyone out there that is trying to uh, get involved with the place. A lot of our interns that have been brought on or even like part time jobs have just reached out with looking for to get their foot in the door, really to do any opportunity that we had available. And based on the opportunities that we had, we were able to hire people on based on what our needs were, not necessarily their exact skill set. So the more, most important thing for people getting their foot in the door, especially with smaller businesses that are our size, is just to reach out and figure out what they need, especially if you're looking to just learn. If, you, if there's a brand that you're really into, a company that does something that you're in a field that you're passionate about, there's no harm in reaching out to see where, you know, if there's anything you can do to get your foot in the door to help out, be it from with general production to helping with some basic marketing needs to content creation. You know, businesses right now are, uh, I guess there's just a lot of opportunity within some businesses. Great. So you're recommending <laughs> that even if there isn't a job posted, that maybe they check out the website, check out your Instagram and whatever other social media platforms you may be using and see maybe if they could come to you with some ideas for things they could do to support you as an intern. That would be like a great way to start. Yeah. And that's, you put it a lot more eloquently than I, uh, I just put it, but yeah, absolutely. Like we have numerous people on our payroll right now that reached out via Instagram DM that just said, Hey, I'm looking to get a summer internship for product design. I think I could bring some stuff to the table. I would love to sit down and chat with you about it. And, uh, we, you know, had an interview with them and had some stuff on the table that you could bring that would help us. And it went from, a looking at a part-time internship and now he's a full-time position here. Oh, wow. um, with a, a, a lot of responsibility and he's still in college. So that's, you know, that's one small example, but even on the, the production and for someone that wants to get their hands dirty to learn how to, you know, operate embroidery equipment or, or learn like the shipping process for an e-commerce brand. Yeah. Just simply reaching out even, uh, I mean, email is probably more preferred than <laughs> Facebook or Instagram direct message, but yeah, a simple message like, Hey, I'm a college student that is really interested in this. Uh, I was curious if you had any opportunities for me to get involved, be it part time or on call or fill in for someone gets sick. Any opportunity, my foot in the door, I would love to use my skill set to help you guys. So, yeah, I mean, we, we don't po we've never posted a job <laughs> request or anything like that. We've just kind of slowly filled our team based on our needs and based on word of mouth. And at least for us, a lot of these people that have kind of reached out somewhat. A good example of this is a, a graphic designer and graphic design, especially in Portland, but really anywhere is a difficult field to get involved with. And we had a designer reach out like multiple years ago, like, hey, I'd love to work with you guys. Here's my portfolio. Let me know if you're interested. And at the time, we weren't interested. But I saved his info and I save all the people that reach out to us with their design portfolio. And uh, sure enough, one day our designer left and we needed to find a new one. So I just started from the list and started reaching out to all of our old people who had reached out for that. And now that is our main graphic designer. And it all happened because a couple of years ago, he reached out with a simple email. So I think the most important thing on that end, if you're interested in working with a brand or company, is to simply reach out, get your foot in the door, introduce them, try to find a way to provide value, try to find a way to help them, even if they're not necessarily looking for that. Especially right now, again, e-commerce is booming. A lot of the brands right now that do strong e-commerce are doing really well and are actually in a position where they are looking to hire and they are looking to bring people on, at least from my experience and you know the people in my immediate community of similar brands. So Nice. Nice. That's really helpful. Thank you. So what about a useful, hard and soft skill, Jimmy, what are the ones that you look for in the young people that you hire at Finley Hats? 
I think the big picture is attitude. That's not necessarily a skill, but I think it's more important than a skill. We have a really chill and good work environment because we bring on friendly, like-minded, just good people here. And as a result, the work environment is chill and is we get stuff done. We're all self-motivated. So I think regardless of any hard or soft skill, I think you got to have that positive mental attitude coming into a place. I think that is when we're, when we're interviewing, when we're talking to people, that is one of the first things we look for as far as getting your foot in the door is someone that has a positive mental attitude, And that can bring some creativity and some new ideas and some new direction to the company as a whole. Pass that as far as actual like immediate skills. I think being able to not be afraid to ask for help is something that is awesome. We're we're going through a lot of new hires right now. We're actually, I think, up to like 16 employees. And the last last few months, we've had to hire on a lot of production people. And one of the things we've ran into is we have some people that get a little overconfident. And as a result, they don't want to ask for help. They just want to show that they can do it. And that can actually cause problems. So you've got to walk that line between being able to be self-sufficient and able to take care of yourself, but also don't be afraid to make sure you're doing it right. And kind of, you know, especially when you're in the training phase. One more thing I think too, is just being kind of, I guess to expand on that is self-motivating. That's another thing where it's really obvious as an employer, when you have employees that have a go get them attitude, that will, you know, work hard to get the job done and not cut corners and do what we need versus the people who will just do the bare minimum to get by and, you know, aren't really, don't really have their head in in the right place for it. I mean, there's, when it comes to hiring, there's lots of different types of employees, right? But if you're looking to make a name for yourself within the company, if you're looking to get the most out of it, if you're looking to progress, having that an extra drive to really get stuff done is I think a really important piece, not just escaping by and doing the bare minimum because your boss notices that and your manager notices that. And if you're doing the bare minimum and you're, cause you're, you're not happy there or you don't care, then, you know, it shows in your work and it'll show in like your progression within the company. So I think yeah. even at 110%, I mean, that's, I think that's probably cliche, but as far as an employer, that's something that we want. And that's something that, you know, we have some employees that do go the extra mile all the time. And as a result, they've, grown within the company, their responsibilities have increased, their pay has increased, their opportunities have increased versus we have people who just do the bare minimum every day and they've been stagnant. Yeah. It's like you get what you give. (laughs) Yeah, totally. totally. What about someone's major, Jimmy? Is it a deciding factor to get into entrepreneurship? In other words, if they haven't studied it, is it a deal breaker? Absolutely not at least for running a business. I come from a photography background. Like you you said earlier, I I did not go to school for business. Granted, photography, you know, I ran a photography business. I know how to bring in clients. I know how to do my accounting. I know how to do the marketing. I, you know, I've done a lot of stuff in the business world through my photography background and photo school taught me some of that. But no, like the, the business world, there's many roads to success with it. And for some people, business school is totally the route that they need to take and fully support anyone that wants to do that. But I would definitely say it's not a required step to major in business or anything in that side, you know, that that world. You know, the Internet is filled with an amazing amount of resources from podcasts like this to books to courses on Udemy to mentorship to coaches. There's so many opportunities that are you can learn and and you can learn on your own time and teach yourself. There's so many good communities from Facebook groups to Reddit to a bunch of different opportunities out there to learn. And I owe pretty much majority of my business knowledge just to the Internet, just to spending years of time (laughs) dedicated to learning everything I can. And then also a lot of trial and error, but no, no business degree got me where I am today. And same with other than our, our product designer who's going to school for product design. No one else, like I said, no one else here is classically trained in what we're doing here. Nice. Um, but again, there's different strokes for different folks. And I, I fully support if someone thinks, you know, school is the way for them, that's more power to you. But I don't think it's a required piece to be an entrepreneur, to run your business, to do that side of the things. Yeah. And what about a graduate school degree and less so for somebody who's trying to get in on the ground floor, more so for somebody who wants to run their own company once again. Is it important? Do you think it would be valuable for them to get an MBA or if not an MBA, is there another grad school degree? I for sure think there's a lot of value in that. I uh, no doubt far from a top tier businessman. I am proud of the company I run. I'm proud of the employees we have. I'm proud of what we've built. 
But I'm sure if I had an MBA under my belt, if I went to business school and went through, jumped through those hoops, I probably would have made a lot less mistakes that I did that I'd learned the, the hard way. I probably would be in a different position than I am now. Things would, would definitely be, we would have gone a different route to get to wherever we would be that way. So I'm sure there's there's plenty of value in that. But again, I think it comes down to the individual if, if they see the value in that versus if they think spending the however much time it takes to get that far purely diving into just building their business and just focusing on that side of their uh, career, like actually getting their hands dirty, building the business rather than just studying how to build the business or a business. And it's not just the time spent studying. It's also the money (laughs) to be in school. So I think those are great points, Jimmy. What about life experiences? So those experiences we have outside the classroom, like you with photography, for example, what do you think are the most useful kinds of life experiences for someone starting out in this field to try to cultivate? Oh, travel. Travel's huge. I think opening your your mind to the world around you and what is out there, I think is huge. I've been to every continent. I love traveling. I have done a lot less of it since I started Finley, but I think travel is a huge piece and it's, it's kind of, I think just an an essential piece of being, well, not an essential piece, but an important piece to being well-rounded and having kind of a worldly view. I think uh, when it comes to running a business, marketing and just understanding humans, understanding human behavior, understanding how the hive mind of our civilization works, I think is really important. And I think the more input you get by experiencing different cultures and seeing different landmarks and diving into all the different opportunities that are out there on this planet, I think will help you get your finger on the pulse of our civilization. And as a result, put you in a position to better leverage yourself to take advantage of it in in a positive way to make a positive impact and or grow your, your business. I think another one too is just networking. I think that's another important piece is just it's it's they always say it's it's all about who you know and it's crazy how just one conversation with a brilliant individual can change the course of your life you know from that moment on so I think that's another important piece too is to be social meet people not just go out to parties not just go to <laughs> meetups or things like that. No, I, I totally get it. And I could not agree more, Jimmy. I am somebody who's had the privilege of traveling all around the world, much of it for various jobs I've had, working for Mercy Corps as a journalist with CNN, working for the American Red Cross. I mean, I've traveled all over the world and I want to weave that into the networking piece because a lot of times it's seen as like a bad word. There's like a bad connotation to it. And I think where you're coming from is that just meeting people like human to human, you can have some of the most unbelievable, mind-blowing experiences that can alter your life if you're open to it. And if you're open to learning about new cultures and learning about new societies and new languages and all of that, you just can't even imagine like the impact that that has on your brain. Yeah, absolutely. So, Jimmy, what is the best part for you of being an entrepreneur and being in the e-commerce space? So the best part of being an entrepreneur to me is simply having complete control over my day to day life of my favorite quote. Talk about little things that can impact the trajectory of your life. Quote from Bob Dylan about what is success. Uh, Someone is a success if they wake up in the morning and get to bed at night and in between do what they want to do. And that stuck with me since I was in high school and has been definitely a driving force behind everything I do. And, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur allows me to do what I want to do every day from when I get up to when I go to bed. Love it. And uh, it just just so happens, you know, for the last seven years, it's been wake up, work all day and go to bed. But I, I do have the, you know, complete control that if I want to take a week off, if I want to take time off to go do this, I don't have to ask for approval. I don't have to get it in writing for my boss. I don't have to do anything. If I want to work a half day, if I want to sleep in, if I want to go do something, I, I have complete control over that. And also I have, a, you know, complete control over what my income do, my income is. And I have complete control over making a positive impact. We can choose where we want to donate our funds. 
options. We can choose, you know, how much to pay our employees and give reward or give benefits. So yeah, there's all of those are, are really good feelings. And I, and I'm, I, I can expand on all of these so much because there's so many positive things about it. But one more thing that I really love about being an entrepreneur is I come from a photo background and that uh, source of that is I love to create. And I think creating, taking something that doesn't exist and bring it into the real world is an extremely powerful thing. And I've just, I love the creation process. I love seeing like creative geniuses. It's just creation's <laughs> awesome. So what's, what's cool is a business is basically like the ultimate form of creation because we're taking something that was a concept, just a simple hat idea that has now evolved into something that is worn by tens of thousands of people around the globe, literally feeds and supports over 15 people, has able to been able to make a real world positive impact through our donation opportunities, as well as we've built a community of people that, you know, are passionate about the brand that collect it and want to wear something that we have created from a design element. That's cool from a person to person element. It's cool. So just all around the creation process of building the brand is another thing that I love. And uh, I can't really pick a favorite out of the the ones I just mentioned there because all of those are awesome, awesome features of being an entrepreneur. Oh my God, your passion, just like is blowing things up here in the airwaves. I can just <laughs> feel it. It's like so much positive energy. Yeah. Woo! All right. So we know, Jimmy, <laughs> that every job, even being your own boss, has a flip side to it. So what's the part of your current job as the founder and the head honcho at Finley Hats that sucks the most? I have multiple answers for this one too, but the first thing is that comes to mind is the sacrifices the rafting trips with friends I've had to miss, the family dinners I've had to <laughs> sit out on, the selfish moves I've had to do in the name of building a business, the relationships lost, the traveling I haven't been able to do, the things I can't afford, the loneliness of working 80-hour weeks. All of those are sacrifices that are made in the name of all the stuff that I, I went over in the last answer. So there is another side to all of it. And if I wasn't, if that, if I wasn't passionate about building this. And if I wasn't, you know, here to build something that I'm proud of and hope lives on beyond, uh, you know, my lifetime, it would be tough to, to be worth it. So, you know, when you talk about being an entrepreneur, you talk about running a business, it's not all roses. There's lots of difficult times and sacrifices that need to be made. And, you know, the road's not for everyone. And that's why so many businesses, a piece of why so many businesses fail. So, I mean, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind too, that, you know, you go on Instagram and you see all the entrepreneurs, all the CEOs with their Lamborghinis and their private jets and flexing and all that. And everyone's like, oh, I want that lifestyle. But they don't realize that either... <laughs> A lot of times that that's not actually like it's fake. It's that stuff's all bought just for part of their marketing persona. Or if it is real, the amount and they actually did grind and work hard to get to where they are, which I know countless people have done. They're not showing the 80 hour work weeks. They're not showing the missed family and friends time. They're not showing all the, the sacrifices that go into make that a reality. So um, I think it's really important to remember that there is a dose of reality and it isn't all fun and games. And there is a lot of hard, thankless work. So yeah, I think that's the biggest one. Second biggest, is, that's a lot less epic is just HR, dealing with people, dealing with drama, dealing with hiring, firing, promoting, all that side of things. It's just exhausting on the day to day. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that reality check. So, Jimmy, what is the best career advice you've ever gotten? Oh, um, I mean, that Bob Dylan quote, I think, would, would still shine true over any piece of you know career advice I, I've got from anyone. And that's not even a direct piece of advice, but that's a mentality. I think we'll expand one more to another one of my favorite. It's not even a quote. It's more of a slogan. But I think it is just extremely important. And it comes from our good friends and another Oregon-based brand. Most people might have heard of it. They're called Nike. Oh, yeah. And their slogan of... Uh, or tagline, I don't know, slogan, tagline, whatever, of uh, just do it is very simple and easy to easy to swallow, but not easy to execute on. And I think that's one piece of advice that I think has a lot more heavy importance under it than, than a lot of people take credit for. I think so many people have ideas and 
concepts and things that they want to do and they just don't ever do it. I see it with some of my close friends. They've had ideas for a business they want to start or a product they want to launch and they just go through endless phases of testing and trial and error and doing all this stuff to get ready for launch and then launch day never comes and then they miss the boat and miss the opportunity the you know whatever's gone and I think a lot of people are hung up on trying to get something perfect and not actually just getting out there and just doing it. So I think that's for me that was the simple thing of I need to do something other than photography. I need to start something else. And, you know, the simple (laughs) slogan of just do it is what instead of, you know, spending years and years perfecting Finley, getting it ready for the launch, I just, we, we dove right in. We spent a couple months to get everything, our ducks in a row and then launched it. We didn't wait for perfection. We didn't have the embroidery machines. We didn't have everything we needed to launch, but we got everything we could together and just did it. So I think that's another one that was important to me. It's simple, but I think it's really important for anyone listening that might be on the fence about doing their, uh, you know, following their dreams, following their passion, following uh, an idea. Love it, Jimmy. And my sense is as well that there may be fear involved in holding some people back. And to all of them, I want to say, and Jimmy, I don't know you. (laughs) (laughs) I have done some reading and some prepping for this interview. So I've got a sense of you, but tell me if this is true or not. I was afraid and there are times that I'm still afraid. I mean, my God, yes, absolutely. And I guess you were and are too. It's not that we aren't afraid. We have just been able to manage our fear and get over that threshold of fear, kind of like if you're into extreme sports, and I know you shot a lot of extreme sports. It's not that these guys don't have fear, but they get off on it, (laughs) right? Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, fear is an unavoidable part for, you know, humans bringing anything to the world. And I think that that kind of the fear kind of stems from that concept I was saying earlier, where you're taking something that doesn't exist and you are bringing it into the world and hoping it'll be accepted. And fear of rejection is something that's like hardwired into us as humans. You know, we used to be rejected as like cavemen, you know, we would die. You know, we'd be kicked out of the tribe or whatever. That's like, to my understanding, uh, uh, something that's pretty hardwired in, into us. And so fear of rejection, fear of failure is something that you definitely have to get over. And it's something that Again, the only way to really do it is you just got to do it. You just got to, um, if you're, if you're held up on something, if you're held up on an idea you don't want to execute on one simple thing that you can, you can lay out is, okay, what's the absolute worst case scenario? If I follow this dream, if I launch this brand, if I create this product and when you start to dive deep and keep asking why or what there's, it becomes a little bit less scary when you actually define the absolute worst case scenario. Like, okay, if you quit your job to pursue this, like, could you find another job in two months? It doesn't work. Could you move back in with your parents? Could you move in with a friend? Could you sell your whatever motorcycle to pay for an extra month's living? Like, you know, there's, as soon as you define what the actual worst case scenario of what's holding you back, it becomes a little bit less scary and and a little bit more manageable. And I think another thing that helps yeah, kind of uh, extinguish that fear is just by doing it a lot. When you do, when you when you launch a product a lot, you start to understand your your audience better. A good example of this is my photography career, and I remember when I was just getting into senior portraits, which was my bread and butter. I did commercial, did sport, all that fun stuff, but senior portraits. I made more in forty five minutes than I make in a week sometimes, or wow. often. Yeah, it was it was awesome. It was it was seasonal, but it was awesome. Good money. But I remember early on in my senior portraits, I was just like, man, this photo. I feel like it looks good, but I am just worried that she is not going to like it. It's really tough to get a flattering photo of her or the lighting just doesn't look right or whatever. I'd be, I'd be, I doubt my, my professional ability and my eye. And, you know, after doing hundreds of shoots, that fear kind of disappeared as I was able to tell myself, no, you're a professional. You've been doing this for years. You've shot hundreds of people. You know how to create a good photo you know more about it than they do. You're doing the best you can with this lighting, with this subject, with this whatever. You're going to, they're going to love it. And that just came from doing it a lot. The early on fear made me improve and made me learn what to do and what not to do. And then slowly as became more and more of a master of it or professional at it, 
that fear slowly dissipated as I was able to trust my confidence, trust my artistic eye, trust my client experience. So there's there's lots of ways to combat it, but I think laying out the the worst case scenario and then also just doing it a lot, just getting out there and doing it because that that'll those two things will get you through it from my experience. Fantastic advice, Jimmy. Thank you so much for sharing that. Two final espresso shots. What movies, if any, or Netflix, Hulu, Amazon shows, or books do you think accurately depict this profession? Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. It's his biography. I've listened to it, I think, almost three times through. Made me cry a little bit towards the end. First time listening, at least. I think that is a phenomenal book just on just starting a small business with an idea and expanding it to a you know billion dollar global empire i think that is one of the biggest influences as far as it recent readings okay um, i just want to let that, our listeners who may not be familiar the, the five of them out there who may not be familiar who with who phil knight is he's the founder of oh, nike yeah. yeah founder of nike oregon native and uh yeah all around big inspiration super interesting guy and Nike's, you know, that's a, we could, I could talk a lot about them. They, you know, they're a really interesting subject too, because they get so much flack. I, I, I like those guys. We'd love to work with them and make some hats someday, but that's one. And then another one that's really, uh, the hit the close, pretty close to home as far as, you know, building a, a brand in the action sports, streetwear, lifestyle, outdoors field is this is not a t-shirt by Bobby hundreds of the streetwear brand, the hundreds. Hmm. Great. That was a, yeah, that was another one that just, it's, it, it's an interesting read, you know, hearing about this pretty legendary streetwear company, how they started and the steps they took to get to where they are today. So those are two books I would definitely recommend as far as close to actually depicting what goes on in a, a small business situation. There's so many relatable, understandable scenes that go on in, in both of those books. Past that, I can't really think of any TV or movies that have really accurately depicted uh, the chaos that is starting your own brand. Uh, maybe Silicon Valley uh, oh, yeah. on HBO. That has some similarities to what we experience here on maybe on a different scale, but they definitely there's some relatable things that they go through. And it's just very entertaining. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Well, we'll include links to all of those in our show notes. Final espresso shot. What would Java junkies be surprised to learn about this profession? I think the most people would be surprised to see know that we're you know a, a seven figure brand, and as the founder and owner of this company, I am the lowest paid employee here. I think that's one that I, I don't talk about very often, and it's also not. I, I understand the <laughs> the implications for you know I, I should be paid more for growth sake. Like if when someone it's time to bring someone on who does what I do, <laughs> the budget for that isn't there if I'm not being paid what they should be being paid. But again, falling back to sacrifices, I'd rather bring on a new employee that can help get more orders out or help with this new area of production rather than personally take home more at the end of the day. My pay hasn't changed in I think three years now. And it's, you know, like we have people who come on and immediately are <laughs> at a higher pay rate. So I think that's one thing that might be surprising that you know, I'm here to build a brand. I'm here to build something that has, brings immense value and, and positive has a positive impact on the, the world. And at this stage of the business, I don't need to be taking more home than I need to. It's, it's you know, if, if my car breaks down, I can pay myself more to pay for it. If I, you know, if I'm ever short on something, I can always pay myself what's needed to cover that. But yeah, I think that might be one little surprising piece of the business that there is, you know, talk about sacrifices, even, even on that level is a, you know, an extra piece. Yeah. And talk about a part of your current job that sucks the most. But anyway, <laughs> Jimmy, I want to thank you so much for making time for coffee today with me and the T4C community. Jimmy's business is Findlay Hats. That's F-I-N-D-L-A-Y hats.com. Check it out. They're super, super cool. And also check out show notes for this episode to see if Jimmy's main T4C interview has already dropped. That's what we're going to get into what he does, how he started Findlay, and how he's built his career to date. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. 
for having me. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I hope uh, your listeners found this informative and make themselves a great day. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of t for c And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for Coffee website under the coaching tab at time, the number four, coffee.org or text me at 202-236-5712. That's 202-236-5712. Thank you.